Good afternoon, everyone, and thank all of you for attending this session as the Cleveland Foundation's annual meeting presented by KeyBank continues. My name is Romney Smith. I am a journalist at WKYC and the weekend morning anchor and also an education reporter. So, of course, after 11 years of reporting on schools, this year is quite different than any year in the past. Um, I want to let you guys know we've been very busy and we are not alone in having these conversations, but I am pleased to bring you this particular breakout session on closing the digital divide. And I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our panel today. First up, we have Leon Wilson, the Chief of Digital Innovation and Chief Information Officer for the Cleveland Foundation. Good afternoon, Leon. Good afternoon. We also have Kurt Williams, the Cleveland Foundation Digital Innovation Fellow. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Romney. And we also have Angela Seifer, the Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Good afternoon. Hi, Romney. Thanks for having me. We certainly appreciate all of you guys for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Quick note to all of our attendees, we want you to get something out of this tangible. We want you to interact with us. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask questions as we go. Now, keep in mind, after the initial dialogue, that's when we're going to get to the questions and answer as many as possible as related to today's presentation. So, believe me, continue to type them. We see them. We're going to try to get to as many as possible, leaving about 15 to 20 minutes. So we, we want you guys to be interactive with us. Also, I have to say again, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. This is an important conversation. So let's get started. We're gonna start by framing the whole conversation. So when we talk about the environment that we're in, about education, Leon, I'd like you to start by setting the stage with what exactly is the digital divide and talk about digital equity versus digital inclusion, because those are not the same thing. Oh, absolutely. And thank you, Romney. So the digital divide, that is a term that is about a 25-year term. It was coined um, by a gentleman named Larry Irving when he was working in the um, Clinton and um, Gore administration, talking about basically at that time this binary issue of folks not having computers in their homes or people not having access to internet in their homes. Now, you have to think about that from a 25-year span. 25 years ago, we we're all being inundated with America Online CDs, and it was all about entertainment and we and we were trying to get connected but in when we fast forward till today the internet is a lot different today than it was 25 years ago 25 years ago it was a, it was it was an as i said it was an, it was entertainment it was an option it was a courtesy even during the dot com era when we were talking about things like the introduction of amazon and the introduction of google and buying things online that was just our um, exposure in the early 2000s over these last 10 years, though, that's where the Internet has pivoted to becoming a nicety to a necessity. And what is problematic is that the whole impetus for how the Internet is provided to us by telecom providers, by cable providers, their business model has not shifted along with the shift of society. So what you find today is is neighborhoods, especially in major urban areas, but it is also a rural issue, where the investment in, in internet access is not equitable, like we see investment in other utilities, such as water, electricity, gas, things of that nature. And when we talk about digital inclusion, we were talking about trying to keep those folks included. But when we talk about digital equity, we're talking about the equitable inclusion and lack of and exclusion of folks. We want to make sure that it's, it's more than just the technocratic access to computers and internet access. It is really thinking about this from a social um, in social equity standpoint. And as Ron Richard talked about, you know, one decision might make a life change alteration with you in the criminal courts. Um, where you live should not dictate whether you're able to participate in this new digital economy or not at the right level, at the right scale, if we make this pivot. So it, we're still in this journey but we're living with infrastructure that was predicated on the internet being treated as an entertainment, as a commodity, and not as a necessity. So that leads me to my next question, which any of you guys can weigh in on, which is taking that definition, now let's apply it to Cleveland. What do the inequities in Cleveland look like 
as it relates to the digital divide? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one, at least to start. Excuse me. Um, this has been the big question um, of the day, and as, as we've had discussions, especially since the pandemic, and, and so many people have focused on this, um, everyone wants to know what this looks like. Uh, how many people in Cleveland don't have a computer? How many don't have broadband? Um, and unfortunately, this, this, highlights, this question highlights the poor data that exists. Um, the best and most comprehensive source is the American Community Survey. Um, however, the most recent data is from 2018, and with how, how fast things change, especially with the technology adoption, um, this may not be fully up to date. Um, and so while these numbers are not perfectly accurate, they are the best snapshot we have of the, broad, the broadband landscape as it exists. Um, Jackie, if you could show the, that map that, that I sent you before now. Um, this, is, this does show the, the landscape um, right now. Um, and as we can see, um, uh, many pockets in Cleveland, East Cleveland, are, are the least connected. Um, that, that redlining map that, that was shown when, when Ron spoke, um, it looks just like this one. Um, and that's from the, the historical effects of, 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 of that policy of, of the d discrimination there. Um, and so the exact numbers here, in, in Cleveland proper, about 44% of households are without high-speed broadband in their home. Um, about 34% of households are without a computer, laptop, or tablet. Um, and we have to understand the nuances of the divide, as, as Leon said. Um, yes, people on their smartphones technically have access to the internet, but the numbers that I just said um, group smartphone-only users with those who do not have access. And why? Um, because especially during a pandemic, how can we expect students to conduct their whole education on a foreign screen or unemployed people to look for and apply for jobs and create a resume on a phone? Um, smartphone access just can't replace the full functionality when we rely on broadband for so much. Um, and, and part of that, that reason that people rely on smartphone only access um, is because the difference in, is another number that I'll say, is that the difference in internet adoption between families making under $20,000 a year and those making over $75,000 a year is about 37 percentage points in Cleveland. Um, it's a huge difference and clearly shows that, that this is an affordability issue uh, with broadband adoption. Um, and finally, I, I know I'm saying a lot here and, and, and there's a lot to, to debrief, but I, I want to make sure we know what do these numbers actually mean and what are the implications. Um, I sat in on a webinar or a town hall on Friday um, hosted by Empowering Youth Exploring Justice. Um, just last Friday, and where several Cleveland students shared their experiences having low quality or no internet. Um, and they spoke of the dangers not having the internet during the pandemic and how it interrupts their education and, and mental health. Um, and it's vital that we listen to their stories and, and understand what they actually mean um, and make sure that they have access to the same opportunities through the internet that in communities that don't have, that do have quality broadband do. All right. And Angela, did you want to clarify? Yeah, just for folks that are looking at that map to know that the map is of broadband subscriptions. So we're not, the map isn't saying this is where broadband is available. This is a map of, this is where people actually have subscribed to those services in their home. And as folks dive into this issue, it's important to understand the difference between those two data sets. The data set of where's the internet available, which is still an issue in urban areas also, but this particular map is showing, oh my gosh, 50% of folks just don't have a subscription it might be there. It is, in fact, there, but it's too expensive or they don't know how to use it. All right. Thank you for that. So now that we know our definition of digital divide and equity, inequity, inclusion, and what it looks like from a historical perspective with redlining and then cross that over with who's actually subscribing today, well, about a year ago in real time, now we have a good look at Cleveland and the real-time disparity of what we're talking about. So let's get to what's being done. What has Cleveland been doing to try to bridge the digital divide? Well, I can jump in on that one, Romney. So for the past three or four years at the Cleveland Foundation, as we've been trying to tackle this issue, it's one really, I guess, say, understanding hyper-locally what the issues are and really recognizing that, as Angela mentioned, about affordability. We have to put this in the context of Cleveland from a data standpoint. When you look at the poverty level in Cleveland, when you look at the median income in Cleveland, 
when we toss around these numbers about 44% of homes don't have this or 27% of homes don't have connectivity whatsoever, when you drill down to Pacific neighborhoods, the, 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 uh, the concentration of that explodes. So, yeah, that's across Cleveland. But then when you look to the east side of Cleveland, where you saw that red crescent map go over there, that might be 50%. When you look at that particular neighborhood, when we tried to understand that, we realized that whatever we do, we have to factor in that it is an income issue, that it is a poverty driven stricken issue. And we just can't toss any solution out there if there's affordability in the crux of everything. So we tried, we tried to tackle this from a systemic standpoint, from a system standpoint, partnering with our libraries to see what they can do to help bridge this digital divide. We are blessed in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County to have a wealth of different library branches where you don't have to walk far to get to one. So computer labs and mobile internet hotspot lending programs with the libraries, working with other organizations such as the Housing Authority, CMHA, Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority, to reach those residents residents that are most in need. So when the foundation started tackling this issue, we went to where the where the need was most um, in that red crescent and said, let's tackle that regarding connectivity, regarding access to affordable devices, and also digital literacy training, which is a huge component of that. We think that because we've all been around computers all these years that we all get it. But I will tell you, when you go into a lot of classrooms, a lot of kids knows how to thumb their way through the keyboard, but don't know how to actually use a QWERTY keyboard. Not to the depth and breadth that when it comes time for standardized testing, they don't have to hunt and peck. They can just focus on the question at hand and not figure out where the Q and the T and the R is. So um, drilling in there, that's where we started investing in building that ecosystem, identifying and funding those organizations, and also planting the flag or planting the seeds for people like PCs for People, an organization where we said, well, if we have this issue about poverty, what are some of the other models in other sectors that are addressing that? You have the goodwills for people that are lower income or don't have the, who have the means but need to get, you know, gently used equipment. Or you have the Salvation Army thrift store where you can go in there and get gently used clothing. Is there a model for gently used computers that will always be there? And we identified one. So we invested in bringing an institution here to Cleveland that can provide that kind of wraparound services for them. So in addition to partnering with existing anchor institutions that knew the residents, that had that relationship with the residents, as well as building other ecosystems to support access to devices, access to the Internet, access to digital literacy training, that's where we started. But I will tell you, Romney, that that was a good start. But since this pandemic, things that we might have thought we had five years to get to, we now only have five months. And that is, what are we doing to the home? What I've told you so far is where people came to the anchor institutions. They came to the library. They came to the schools. They came to the digital literacy learning centers. But when we have the shelter in place, there's nowhere to go. So now it becomes ever more important that we now tackle this issue in the home, at the home front about internet connectivity, devices in the homes, digital literacy training that can be delivered remotely. And that's where we're at right now. That actually leads me to a question. We have the very first question um, submitted from our audience, which is how do we get the appropriate infrastructure in urban Cleveland, because it seems like it's a foundational problem. Like you just mentioned, we don't have five years to bridge that gap. We have <laughs> mere months, and some would say we only have days, because as we know, CMSD students go back to school very soon. Yeah. Well, we're partnering with um, CMSD and all a, a lot of other school districts, especially in, in Cleveland proper and in the First Spring suburbs, and everybody's moving expeditiously to see um, about procuring devices and also procuring internet access to our youth. Um, we form what is called the Greater Cleveland Digital Equity Coalition, you know, a group of many, many different anchor, insti anchor, in anchor institutions private sector. So through Greater Cleveland Partnership, they brought their membership to the to the forefront. 
as well as other advocates and so forth to say, okay, how do we make sure that our kids, when it's time to go back to school, they have a device and they have internet access. And that's where we made um, significant sub substantive investments and we will continue to do that. We've established a fund in partnership with Cuyahoga County and, and others to really get the dollars we need to go out there and procure the equipment that is needed for our kids, as well as lean on to our private sector. Eaton Corporation has been a great partner now. GE Lighten and Squires um, Patton Box has been great partners along with others that are coming to, coming to the table to say we have computers that we can donate so you don't have to go out and buy computers because the issue that we're in right now with Cleveland, I'll tell you, every other city in the U.S. is tackling the same issue. And we're now fighting for computers and we're competing for computers with Baltimore and with Austin, Texas and with Detroit. So if we can get them locally, source them locally, we don't have to worry about shipping. We don't have to worry about anything. We can quickly get them out to our kids. So those are the things that we're doing as, as, um, as far as immediate hyper, hyper um, immediate issues. If I could add on there too, yeah. um, just on, on the coalition is something that we knew is that there would have to be a short term immediate solution because kids need to learn right now. They're staying in remote learning. And so that with that, we, we, uh, we talked about the hotspots and, and computers right now, but we always knew that there needs to be a long term play as well because hotspots don't last forever. They're short. They're definitely a short term band aid solution. Uh, and so we, we've been discussing this long term, and, and it's something that is it, that's still uh, we need to coalesce around. And, and how are we going to make this sustainable? How are we going to make this equitable? Um, and how are we going to make this affordable for for all of our residents? Um, but we're using the coalition to do that and, and listen to a diverse group of organizations and voices because it has to be a community issue. For those who don't know, talk to me about what what is the Greater Cleveland Digital Equity Coalition and what's the Cleveland Digital Equity Fund. Um, Kurt, you want to go ahead and take that? Yeah, so the Digital Equity Coalition is a, is a group of, as Leanne said, uh, uh, there's uh, private, there's uh, corporations, there's our healthcare institutions, there's our community-based organizations who are on the ground, the grassroots advocates, um, there's government uh, organizations, all types of, of different people who are coming together and saying, all right, what are we doing? Uh, to, to address this immediately. What are we doing to address this long term? We're making sure we're all staying on the same page because before this coalition, um, everybody was, was doing something and it, and it was great, but we, we might have overlapped a little bit and, and we, could, we didn't have to uh, waste too much time um, if we had uh, talked to each other. So that was the, the point of that. And also to, uh, come, to get, come together so we have a unified voice when we're talking to the, to the state and to the federal level. Um, to advocate for more resources for Cleveland. The Digital Equity Fund um, is, is, uh, was started uh, at the Cleveland Foundation along with uh, money from Cuyahoga County uh, to address these short-term solutions first to make sure that we had some resources to do that. Um, and, and in the future, it's going to go towards these long-term as well. Yes. And what I will add, Romney, is that the way that the coalition is structured is in working groups. So while there's a monthly meeting for people who just want to hear what's going on, and we do that, I believe, the fourth Wednesday of every month around like from 1015 to 1145, you can get with Kurt, Kurt if you want to chime in on that Zoom call, where the real work happens in the six different working groups. One focused on our students, one focused on seniors, one focused on the under and unemployed through workforce development programs, our adults, and then neighborhoods, because we know we got to go horizontal with our neighborhoods. So we have Cleveland Neighborhood Progress and other community development corporations that hear on the street what's going on in their particular neighborhoods, in their particular words, wards, so they can bring that language to us. Then we have advocacy, because as Kurt mentioned, we have to talk about this at the state and federal level. And then finally, another war, um, um, working group is micro businesses, small neighborhood based organizations, one to five person employees that have their own form of digital divide issue about access to technology so they can stay afloat. So my next question is, we're talking a lot about access to the physical equipment to be able to have a Wi-Fi hotspot, to have a laptop or, you know, as a Surface Pro or something to that effect. But talk to me about 
how do these families afford it? Because we're saying, oh, we're going to get you the access to the equipment. But if this means another $15, $20, $30, $50 bill for them, some of these families cannot afford that. And then they might have to choose between food or lights or access to computers, not just for students, but it might be an elderly person as well who has a lack of access to internet connectivity. Talk to me about that aspect of the real world financial hardship and how they pay for it. No, great, great, great question, because I said it all starts with the poverty levels and looking at the residents that we're trying to serve those that need it most. So as far as K through 12, that is being covered, and that's being covered through funds that we're raising through the Digital Equity Fund. Um, We're purchasing the computers, and then PC for People is basically brokering them out. The families can go to PC People, register their names in in, in conjunction with school districts that they're part of, and they can get provisions, these computers that we purchase or either get donated to us from different um, private corporations. The hotspots as well, we went into a two-year deal with T-Mobile to buy thousands of hotspots that we're procuring. CMSD has done likewise. So CMSD has their own plan as far as they're purchasing their own equipment and also hotspots. So any CMSD kit will be sure to have a hotspot and internet access. So that's dealing with the kids. And when we talk about the adults and we talk about the seniors, that is additional dollars that we're raising. Um, We don't need as, as much money. But it's it's through, again, organizations like PC for People and our digital literacy centers where any kind of computer training that will be afforded to you for free. Just you just need to know where to go to which library branch or which digital learning literacy center to go to. As far as do you need a computer, um, PC for People can provide you computers for as cheap as 25 bucks or maybe 50 bucks or 100 bucks if you want to if you want a much better laptop. And if you can't afford anything, PC for People has ways where they can provision you on free computers um, that at least can get the job done. Hotspots are very similar. Income-based, they have, bet, they have special income-based programs where you can get these hotspots for really nominal features, but we recognize that you may not be able to afford that for perpetuity or for a long time. So that's where then partnering with our libraries and expanding their mobile hotspot lending programs for people who want to just need a hotspot temporarily or are going to different locations that we know you can go in there, bring your equipment, hop on their Wi-Fi. Those are all the near and short term while we truly try to tackle the more longer term issues issue of how do we provide an infrastructure and internet services to our residents that are um, available and affordable. Um, The carriers are beginning to step up and trying to decrease the cost of their entry-level internet plans. There are other providers like Digital C that is trying to roll out their own internet, nonprofit-based internet service provider for like 20 bucks a month. And they need to now, they're only operating in certain pockets of Cleveland, they need to scale. But just like electricity and so forth, it does cost something for that. But then we also have subsidies programs to cover people for heating, rent, and cooling assistance and so, and so forth like that. And we'll probably do likewise. So Angela, I'm gonna direct this next question at you. It's coming from the audience, but it's something that popped up with me as well is, Broadband access and equipment as a public utility. Can you speak to that? Sure. So in the United States, our broadband service is uh, not a utility in any sense of the word. Uh, it is, we think of it as a utility because we think, oh, it's essential, but really it's a commodity, right? You purchase it, you purchase what you were able to afford, you purchase what's available in your area like any other commodity. It's very lightly regulated. The internet service providers prefer it to be lightly regulated. Uh, I understand, I understand it's a business, right? But there are those of us in the community who need to then be able to say, okay, here's the needs of our community members. And at times, and it appears this is that time, it is very clear that the needs of the community members are not the same needs as those internet service providers. Right, that we're looking at two different out, two different goals. Uh, so that gets us to the affordability issue because even in places where the infrastructure is available, right, essential service, it's there in some lot, most urban areas, it is there. But if you can't afford it, does it matter if it's there? If you can't afford it, if you can't actually get it into your home, and so this is that point where the regulations become an issue. Where the do we need? to regulate price? Oh, no, no. ISPs say, don't do that. Uh, Let us instead help 
with the cost of the, the internet. So this is now leads us to the idea of a federal subsidy to help cover the cost of the internet. So this is an idea that's in DC right now. The discussion right now is $50 a month that would go towards the cost of that broadband. Because here's the crazy part. So NDIA is national. I can tell you what's going on in Cleveland. I'm sure some folks there think it's not enough. But I can tell you, looking at it nationally, you have a lot going on in Cleveland around solving the digital divide. Some communities, this is not happening, right? So the idea that there's somebody paying for someone's internet access and that money's being raised to pay for that internet access, that's amazing, that's awesome, but it's not happening everywhere. And so we do need federal support for that to happen. We also need federal support to make sure there's money for digital literacy training. Because even if we get everybody access and get them all a device, that digital literacy part is going to be nonstop because technology keeps changing. And if it keeps changing, we have to keep learning. Absolutely. So that leads me perfectly to a call to action. I'm sure you guys all have something to do. We do have questions coming in saying, what can I do? What solutions are being considered? What organizations can I go to? How do I get the word out? I want to be supportive. Talk to me about what people, we've got about 154 participants right now. What can they do today? Who do they email? Who do they call? Who do they donate to, to help get us through this? And I know that there are several answers because it could be money. It could be action. It could be volunteering your time. So just kind of throw some answers out to me. And after you guys all talk, then we're going to get into the direct question and answers we have from our participants. I'll let Kurt start and then I'll follow in after Kurt about what can we do. One, one, one great and, and easy. If, if you have a computer and WKC, WKYC has partnered with us on this, um, is the computer drive at the libraries. Um, if you have an old computer, uh, PCs for People has been needing uh, computers to refurbish and then uh, subsequently give back out to the community. Uh, at your local libraries, they've been doing computer drive the last few weeks. Um, you can bring an old computer there, donate it, um, and, and then it will, it will be reused and, and given to somebody in the community. Yeah. Same thing for small businesses. So if you operate a small business or you're in leadership position, even at a medium to large scale business, think about how you might be able to reprovision some of your older equipment as, as you do your computer refreshes. I mean, we, we really appreciate when we get bulk deliveries or donation of computers that are all consistent, have the same make and model. It helps out in the tech support of it in the, in the, in the, in the rapid delivery and, and distribution of those things. But yet, yeah, as Kurt mentioned, donate of equipment. You can go to your local Cuyahoga County Public Library or Cleveland Public Library, East Cleveland Public Library, and they will make sure that those equipment get to um, PC people so they can be repurposed back out. As far as monetary donations, you can go to the Cleveland Foundation's website if you want to donate, or you can contact Kurt or myself directly if you want to make even if you if you don't you want to donate from a website and you want to say, well, give me the electronic wiring transfer number or how to do it, you can contact us and we'll get you connected. If you just want to be part of the engagement and know what's going on, reach out to Kurt and myself and we'd be more than happy to add your name to the list so that you can get on the monthly Digital Equity Coalition calls. But right now, it's really what we're really trying to do is get the word out, especially when we talk about our family. Some of those families are hard to reach. So if you know a family that has a K-12 kid that needs a computer, that needs internet access in that household, um, tell them to contact PCs or people or tell them to contact their school district because we're talking to those school districts. But sometimes it may be hard to, you know, we're playing phone tag and email tag sometimes with the families. So get the word out about that um, as much as you can. When specifically talking about computers, um, I know that I've been telling people we prefer for them to be seven years old or newer. Is that kind of what you're looking for? Yeah, absolutely. And obviously when you're talking about for K through 12, you know, if it has a webcam, that would be golden um, so that the kids can get on a Zoom call or otherwise we'd have to get a special, you know, webcam to add to that. But, yes, yeah, seven years or younger is obviously ideal. And we will. And even if it's not maybe conducive for the kid for, for remote learning, that computer still might be conducive for a senior or for a working age and individual that is in a workforce development program, maybe taking their own classes at Tri-C or Cleveland State. Um, we can make use of that equipment. We'll find a, a piece of people will find a way for someone that can make use for it um, beyond, um, you know, the three or four year old computer that has a built in webcam that might be best used for um, remote learning for kids. 
Um, Jackie, we might need your help with this. One of the people who are participating is asking a question about sharing the map again or providing a link so that they might be able to present that to their respective organizations and departments. So I don't know if we want to pop that map up again. That way they can screenshot it or if we're going to email that out to participants. But um, there is a question about that. So we will definitely work on that. In the meantime, I'm going to move on to another question, um, specifically about bridging the digital divide among seniors. They're most prone to be socially isolated, which has been shown to have detrimental physical and mental health effects, which we all know is, is a real thing. We know that there's a lot of focus on students because they're going back to school, but as it relates to seniors, is there a separate thing kind of focusing on them? I know, Leon, you did mention a, a branch focused on that. Yes, and I definitely want Angela to chime in because I think she had a great story about seniors as far as getting with teachers. But um, locally, we, we are blessed again to have a couple of digital literacy training centers here in Cleveland that have been focused primarily on seniors for over a decade. They know how to work with seniors, and they're shovel-ready. Um, Ashbury Senior Computing Center has been around for decades um, tackling this issue, working with seniors. We've also, that's one of our working groups in a coalition, so we're working with the Western Area for Aging. We're working with the county. We're working with the city's Department of Aging to see how do we make sure that we connect with the seniors, how do we make sure that the seniors not only have the devices, because we're hearing stories where the grandma or grandpa or the senior says, well, you gave me this device, but I don't know what the hell to do with it. Um, so the training that comes with it, so they know how to do it. They know how to do their FaceTime with their family members because it's also about social isolation, um, which leads to depression. So when we talk about the quality of life for seniors, yes, it's all about telehealth and making sure they connect with their clinicians and their care providers. But it's also about connecting with their family members, their loved ones and their friends, online banking and so forth. So the banks are really interested in this because they want to make sure for online banking for the seniors, safe and secure that there's a connection there. There's a lot that we're trying to do with seniors, but I know Angela might have a lot more, uh, a handful of other stories to share. Just in general, the, the focus on kids is problematic in that our, in many communities, it's a complete focus on the kids. Uh, so when I'm feeling kind of snarky, I'm like, oh, kids live alone, do they? <laughs> right, like <laughs> that we're not taking care of the parents and the grandparents in those communities. And in this current moment in time with the, with the, with the, with COVID, it's not, it's now a life and death issue, right? So we, now we want people to stay in their home so they can be safe. And so for seniors, that is a really big issue. And so making sure that they can stay in their homes, but them staying in their homes, that digital literacy part is super important. So who do they turn to? And I think it's important for all of us to think, okay, who do we turn to? So for some of us, people turn to us, right? Like, my mom turns to me for certain things. I turn to my spouse for other things. Like we have people we turn to, but if you don't have somebody you turn to, then you just don't use the technology, right? Cause you get frustrated. And with telehealth being this, you know, awesome new thing that so many of us are excited to participate in. If we don't have access to that, it becomes a life and death issue. We never used to describe the digital divide as life and death. And now I say my work is life and death because we need people to stay in their homes, right? Uh, so that's, I think that's the senior part and that's the part where the advocacy is really important. Particularly in DC, the conversation is all about the kids because, ah, right? I mean, we're all freaking out about the fact that the kids don't have access. But if we don't also put attention on the parents and in other adults and seniors, we are missing out on this huge opportunity. I actually think we might even be this, this is really rough to say, but the fact that our nationally we are focusing so many resources on the students, when those devices and or that connectivity is only that you could only use it to connect to school, that means there's a device and or connectivity in that home that is limiting those parents or whoever those caretakers are in that home, which means we're not using the limited resources we have to the best way possible. So we have to open that up and this is a particular federal issue, which is why the advocacy and the awareness is so important to be able to make sure that everybody knows that we all need connectivity. We all need digital skills. And so if we don't kind of change our mindset off of the focus on kids and make it about everybody, we're going to waste those limited resources that we have. 
Thank you for that. Um, for those of you who are asking in the question and answer about the map that was shown earlier, happy to report that there will be some follow-up emails, and so it will be included there. So you will have access to that with a little more context as well if you want to present it to your other um, coworkers or friends or fellow organizations. Another question we have coming in from an anonymous attendee is, how will volunteer or tutoring be adapted in the current COVID circumstances? We know people need this digital literacy. If someone wants to help bridge that divide, but they need to do it safely, how do they do that? That's a, that's a great question. And, and I'll, I'll say it. the libraries, the ones that, that we've been working with so, so much have, have adapted and they are off offering um, digital literacy training still in a safe way with um, computers further spaced out, um, safeguards up and, and PPE equipment. If you're not comfortable going into a library still, which a lot of people aren't, which is, which is fine. Um, the organization that Leon uh, mentioned before, Ashbury Senior Computer Community Center, um, has set up a hotline um, that you can call. Um, I'm not sure if it's 24 seven hotline. I would have to check on that. And I don't have the, the number on hand right now, but you can call that and they're happy. They, they're a stalwart in the community, 20 years of experience doing digital literacy training before anybody else was really. Um, and, and they can help you um, navigate uh, whether it's signing up for the internet, whether it's learning a few digital skills, whether it's sharing more resources with you. Um, that, that hotline is a great resource. Um, Angela. I have you can also follow up with. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I have a very specific question for Angela that I think all of you really could answer, but I want to start with her. What should the message be to legislators to make sure that resources are available for all families? I think the message is that COVID drew awareness to an issue that is not a COVID issue, right? We already, the digital divide existed. That didn't change. What changed is people were like, oh, there's a digital divide? <laughs> That's what changed. And because that's what changed, we need to keep their attention on the fact that it, that, that is real. And it's not, it's not because there's a pandemic. The awareness occurred because of the pandemic. And so we need to make sure that our solutions are long term. And so this is having conversations with folks about the fact that not everybody has access to the internet. There is honestly this misunderstanding that because you're carrying around a phone that you have access to the internet. But if there's no data plan on here, there's no, there's no internet, right? But that's not completely understood by lots of folks who are making money kinds of decisions. So building the awareness and then talking about why we need the internet. We need it for telehealth, we need it for work, we need it to find jobs, we need it for education, all the things that everybody knows. All you gotta do is sit down yourself and think about how you use it yourself. Well, everybody else needs to use it for those reasons too. So the message is really the why or what do we need it for and that we need it long term. And this is where it gets real sticky, right? Well, exactly what are the policies that need change? So that's where wel we welcome anyone into those sticky discussions. Uh, NDIA's website is digitalinclusion.org. So if anybody wants to start diving into that, uh, you are welcome. It's all on our website. We try to put as much on there as we can. Uh, it's free to join. So if you want to be part of the conversation, be part of the national conversation. Guys, we presented a lot of information today. We threw a lot at you in terms of what the problem is, the history of it, what's being done, what still can be done, how you can get involved. I really hope you guys took notes and took something away from that. I've been reporting on this daily for weeks now, and it is definitely an issue that's not going away anytime soon. So from a selfish point of view, I'd love if you guys could watch three news for our continuing efforts uh, on this. But again, I want to thank everyone for attending today's session. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. We know we could go on for another hour or two, but we all have to get back to work. Please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to our panelists. I think they did a fantastic job. Thank you guys for your time. Keep in mind, after this, you will receive an invitation to take a pretty brief community survey. So we value your feedback. Please consider sharing your thoughts, even if it's criticism. That's okay. We all want to learn and grow from these sessions on today's event, as well as your vision for a greater Cleveland. Also, there is still time to register for more exciting annual meeting week activities on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Please check out the rest of the series at www.clevelandfoundation.org slash annual meeting. I hope all of you have a great afternoon. Thank you so much for spending some time with us to learn about this very pertinent issue.